Hello everyone, this is Professor Reimer. This video is for my world history class on Wednesday, March 3rd and Thursday, March 4th. It's entitled Unit 7 DOL 3 Comparing the American and French Revolutions. Our objective is to compare the American and French Revolutions by responding to a writing prompt. And as always, let's begin with a preview. It is related to what we talked about last time in the American Revolution. Let's go back and review what were the main causes of the American Revolution. Pause the video now, go check out your notes. All right, so the key idea from the American Revolution is that Americans sought independence from British rule. They're inspired by the Enlightenment ideals. Um, they also felt like uh, they, uh, their, their, uh, their rights were being trampled, uh, both political and somewhat economic. But the result of their revolution was to keep much of British law, much of British social and cultural heritage. I mean, it was, it's known as a, as a conservative revolution. The only thing that really changed was who was in charge. On the other hand, the French Revolution, what we're talking about today, sought to completely replace the Ancien Régime. My French is terrible. Ancient regime, the old order, with a new political, social, and cultural structures. Um, and so today we're going to explore not only the causes of the French Revolution, but also the characteristics as well as the effects in much the same way that we did, uh, as we, that we explored the American Revolution. So here we go. You got your note-taking guide. You printed it. You're ready to go, ready to take notes. You're going to need these notes in order to um, respond to the writing prompt. All right. So um, much more in the French Revolution uh, is uh, the economic factor. Uh, yes, they're inspired by, by, by Enlightenment ideals. Much of the philosophes um, were French. Um, but in May 1789, they have to raise taxes, right? So the French, the French government is, is broke, right? They spent a lot of money helping the Americans fight their revolution, but also fight these other wars. And the French court, represented there by King Louis XVI, spent extravagantly on you know massive parties and clothes i mean look at look what he's wearing um so they're broke uh, in 1789 he calls the estates general their assembly uh they had not met in like over 100 years so he calls them in order because like we got to fix this budget problem now a little bit about the the three estates so it's how french society was divided in the first estate you have the roman catholic clergy about a hundred thousand people and in the second estate, you had the nobles, the nobility, right? Uh, about 400,000. That's not a lot of people. In the third estate, everybody else. It doesn't matter if you're still a serf, if you're a peasant, if you're a laborer, if you're a banker, if you're a shopkeeper, if you're an artisan, it doesn't matter. You fall in this third estate, like 24 million people. However, each estate had only one vote in this estate's general. So as you can imagine, the first two estates normally, usually outnumbered the third estate. Uh, and you see the unfairness of this um, old order represented by the cartoon. So that's the third estate holding up the other two estates, obviously from the point of view uh, of someone from the third estate. So they're meeting. And pretty quickly, the third estate takes control or starts making demands, wanting political and social reform. They, you know, not just, we're not just has a budgetary problem. We have a societal problem that we need to make some serious uh, reform. They're locked out by at one point um, from from the meeting, so they go off to the tennis court uh, and um, basically form their own government. Uh, they declared themselves the National uh, Assembly, and over the next several weeks, um, they begin working as the as the government. Um, and writing a, a, uh, a constitution. And meanwhile, the king is like, well, you can't be doing this. Um, and then on July 14th, a crowd uh, gathers and storms the Bastille. The Bastille was this notorious prison and weapons depot. Uh, they seize the weapons, ammunition, sever the commander's head, parade it through the streets. It, spire, it inspires um, insurrections all throughout France. And now King Louis XVI uh, is advised to, you know, uh, hide out in your not hide out, but like leave Paris, go to Versailles, um, because he has a, a revolution on his hands, and um, the, the police, the army can not be trusted to uh, to keep order. So this is all summer uh, 1789. All right, so those are some of the key causes. Pause the video, go back and review, answer the question. All right, did you get it right? 
They share all the following causes except these are, these questions are hard because you need to eliminate what they both had in common. Did they both have uh, the influence of light and thought? Yes, not A. Did they both have thoughtless and indebted monarchs? Yes, B out. Um, weakening of the Catholic Church. Wait a minute, American Revolution? No, 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 no. But let's, let's double check. D, growing middle class? Yes, in both the American and French Revolution, this growing middle class felt like they were being unfairly treated by the upper class. They wanted some more uh, rights, and so that is a cause. So best answer there, C. All right, now let's move forward as we're comparing the American Revol and French Revolutions. We talked about the causes. Now let's shift more toward characteristics, and we're gathering information to respond to a writing prompt. Now, the characteristics of the French Revolution are going to be quite different than the characteristics of the American um, Revolution. And in fact, I like to think of it like a pendulum, right, on an old clock, swinging from radical to conservative, radical to conservative. In the American Revolution, it wasn't really very radical. And by radical, I mean like heads, heads getting chopped off. Uh, heads will roll. So the American Revolution, there's a there's bloody war, um, but the American revolutionaries were not really seeking to create a new world order. They simply wanted to uh, create a new kind um, of government. Anyway, so in August of 1799, the National Assembly issues the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. It's influenced heavily by the American Revolution by John Locke, uh, the Declaration of Independence, and it proclaimed a number of things. Most importantly, the equality of all men. So in the old order, there was not equality, right? These, the peasants had to pay all these duties and they weren't equal before the law. According to the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, now everyone is equal. Sovereignty, the you know, who uh, or the power of the government resides in the people. And there are these individual rights to liberty, prosperity, and security. So claimed the National, or the, um, the national Assembly. It starts making reforms, right? It's, it is the ruling body. Um, the king is still uh, in, at Versailles. So it ends the fees and labor services the peasants owe the landlords. For example, let's say I grow some grapes. I want to make some wine. I have to pay a fee to the landlord who controls the wine press in my village uh, to make my wine. Just one example. The National Assembly seizes church lands, right? Remember, France is broke. So they seize these church lands um, and began to... Uh, sell them off as a way to raise money. Completely abolished the first estate, got rid of um, that um, body completely. Remember, that's the um, the church uh, officials. The clergy declares them as civilians, requires them to take an oath of loyalty to the state. Remember, this is founded on these enlightenment ideals of, of toleration, but also separation um, of church and state and, and the sort of like setting the society setting the people on this path of reason and away from superstition. So argued um, people like um, Voltaire. As for the king, he was made the chief executive, but not he did not have any legislative authority. So this kind of um, government is called a constitutional monarchy. And lastly, many property, men of property could vote. So it's not completely radical. And in other words, like it's not calling for um, a democracy. Uh, it's not calling for the king to lose his head, right? It's this like small incremental um, reforms. And I say incremental because it's going to get crazy quick. So in all of this chaos, rulers of Austria and Prussia decide they want to invade France, support the king. Revolutionaries sensing or, or, or um, believing that they're about to attack, they launch the war first. And in order to sort of fight this war, uh, and in order to carry out um, uh, the defense of this of the homeland, um, a new uh, legislative body is created. It's called the convention. Now things are going to get radical. So the convention abolishes the monarchy. Get rid. Get rid. Get rid. Get, rid, get gets rid of it completely. That's what I meant to say. Proclaims France a Republic. Remember, a republic is a form of government in which people elect their rulers, and their ruler is not going to be a monarch. In fact, they are going to execute their monarch using 
uh, a new scientific, a rational killing device called the guillotine. So called because it did not inflict pain and death was quick, as in, you know, pull the lever, gravity brings down the sharp knife, slices your head off. Uh, so King Louis XVI and his wife are executed in 1793 uh, as the convention moves toward um, total war by um, enforcing universal conscription. In other words, everyone of fighting age has to go off and fight. In this radical phase, a new individual comes to power. His name is Maximilien Robespierre. He's the leader of what are called the um, the Jacobins. These are uh, a political club that um, comes to influence in the convention, during the convention. Um, and he comes to lead the Committee of Public Safety, whose job is to ensure public order. And what they really did in order to ensure public order um, is uh, launch a campaign of terror uh, to promote their agenda. They're much more radical agenda like eliminating completely the influence of Christianity so they close churches um, they force priests to marry they promoted this new quote-unquote cult of reason so they completely get rid of like church services and they turn the churches um, into um, temples of reason they even created a new calendar to get rid of all vestiges of um, religious influence in society uh, and sadly, um, between the summers of 1793 and 1794, they execute um, at least 40,000 um, people, nobles, clergy, members of the Third Estate, anyone deemed uh, an enemy of the revolution. All right. Um, eventually, the convention arrests Robespierre and his allies, convict them of treason, and execute them. And the terror, as it was known, um, subsides. And remember, I talked about this pendulum, right? So. We had made some, some conservative reforms uh, under the National Assembly. And then we went really radical with the convention and the Committee of Public Safety. Now it's going to swing back conservative as conservative men of property seize power uh, and rule from 1795 to 1799 under a new institution called the Directory. Basically, it's a, it's a middle way. So um, there's a legislative body uh, elected from men of property uh, and of these people. Uh, there's a group of five um, that uh, are have the executive power. Um, basically, it, um, it you know devolved into corrupt um, corrupt rule. And in 1799, Napoleon Bonaparte is going to stage a coup d'état, a seizure of power. But before we get to uh, Napoleon, let's make sure you were paying attention. Go back, review your notes, pause the video, answer this question. All right. Did you get it right? D, popular sovereignty. Remember the idea that people have the right to choose their own type of government, their own um, rulers, how they want to be ruled. That is the principle um, uh, imposed or opposed uh, to the monarchies that preceded them. Okay. Remember, we're comparing the American and French revolutions. We just finished talking about the characteristics of the French revolution and how they tended to be far more radical than the American um, Revolution. Now we're going to turn it to our, the effects of the French Revolution. And in order to do that, we have to talk about Napoleon, who both brings an end to the revolution and helps spread its ideals um, beyond the uh, borders of France. So who was Napoleon? He's an officer, a military officer under King Louis XVI, uh, becomes a general at an early age. Uh, he comes from quite humble backgrounds, but he had some talent as a young man, went to a military, uh, school got some great experience um, in the early um, wars of the revolution uh, and has some great success, especially in 1796, 1797. Um, and he returns to France, remember, and joins the directory um, and helps uh, stage a coup. Basically, a coup is like get rid of the old people, take over. Um, eventually, he calls himself the first consul, um, but then eventually he crowns himself uh emperor as he imposes a new constitution so what were some we're going to turn to both his domestic reforms but also um, what's going on internationally so first domestically so he needs to consolidate power 
And one way he does this is making peace with the Catholic Church and then makes an agreement with the Pope. He says, all right, we're going to keep those lands, but we're going to recognize Roman Catholic Christianity as the preferred faith of France. We're going to pay the priests salary. So it's, it's a compromise, but it's a very popular compromise, both with people who got church lands, but also um, with many French, uh, French people who were devoutly Catholic. One of his most lasting legacies um, is the creation, the establishment of the Civil Code or so-called Napoleonic Code, which codifies many of the um, gains of the revolution, like political and legal equality for all adult men, establishing a merit-based society, so a society based on your, uh, your talent and not so much on your birth or social standing. It also is going to protect private property. So it's, again, a bit conservative in that it allows these aristocrats to return to um, France. All right, now let's turn to, oh no, I forgot, a few more, a little bit more about um, Napoleon as a, as a ruler. Um, he establishes what's often called now an authoritative, authoritative rule. He rules as an authoritarian. And what I mean by that is he begins to limit free speech by censoring and sometimes closing down newspapers, establishes a, a secret police, um, um, manipulates public opinion, um, ignores elective bodies. So this is why I see he brings an end to the revolution because this is not um, uh, these you know, revolutionary uh, ideals. He is, he is in firmly entrenching himself um, in power as uh, authoritarians tend to do. All right, however, he is, he is loved because of his ability to defend France and to spread um, the revolution. He does this in um, on again, off again wars with this coalition of Russia, Great Britain, and Austria from 1799 to 1807. He has great success um, in these victories. And in 1807 to 1812, he has this grand empire of an enlarged France, including parts of, um, of Western Italy, um, you know, land, German lands to the Rhineland. Um, and then in the outside of this enlarged France, he has what are called dependent states. Basically, he puts his relatives um, as rulers of places like from Spain, Portugal, um, and in these other countries, countries that he defeated, um, like Austria, like Prussia, he um, he uh, rules them through um, uh, tribute. All right, this empire does a few things. Number one, it's like I said, it spreads the principles of the revolution, right? He really wanted to destroy the old order, get rid of the special privileges for the nobility and clergy, spread that Napoleonic uh, code, this um, equality of opportunity, equality before the law. But he encounters two things that ultimately um, brings down his, uh, his empire. Number one, the British and their navy. He cannot defeat them at sea and he cannot defeat them economically, even though he tried. And secondly, perhaps more importantly, nationalism. And this is an idea we are going to discuss a lot in the last two, six weeks. Um, it is this belief in this unique culture identity of a people. What I mean by that is there's a group of people that all share common language, a common culture, a common religion, a common sense of origin. Um, and even though these people may live in a in a large area in, in which they might not sort of know each other you know it's not like a village we're talking about that that they all have this common uh, common heritage this common this common belief um and so as napoleon invades these other places he inspires in people this you know resistance um to his uh to his invasions uh and the people see in him and in the French, this is French identity, and they began to think of themselves in similar ways and as a way to oppose um, uh, Napoleon. Uh, and what's that, how that's going to manifest itself later on in the 19th century is that these groups of people, like the Hungarians, like the Poles, like the Czechs, are going to say, you know what, in order to protect our, our, our nation, 
uh, our, our identity as a people, we must have our own state, popular sovereignty. All right. His empire is eventually going to fall uh, because he foolishly decides to invade Russia too late in the year. Uh, so by the time he gets to Moscow, uh, Moscow was burning. The Russians had retreated and refused to engage Napoleon in a fight. Um, and he's forced to retreat. Uh, and the uh, 600,000 that he left France with, uh, only about 40,000 um, return, or I'm sorry, 30,000 um, make it back. Uh, to France. So it emboldens his other enemies, most notably the British, um, to attack and they force him to abdicate his throne in 1814. But that's not that's not the end of the story. Uh, he gets exiled not far from his homeland, so he's able to escape, return to France, reconstitute the army, um, uh, and then the British finally defeat him at Waterloo in what is today Belgium, and this time banish him to the remote island of St. Helena, where he most likely died of lead poisoning from the paint in the wallpaper. So the heat from the island uh, sort of melted the paint and the fumes uh, eventually uh, poisoned and he dies in 1821. Um, but the, um, the ideals of the revolution, they are going to live on till to this day, right? You see these in, in slave revolts. Uh, you're going to see these in, in revolts uh, in Latin America, which we'll turn to in our next lesson. You're going to see um, the ideals of the French Revolution uh, in the women's rights movement, um, these, you know, these enlightenment ideals personified in the French Revolution um, are going to live on. All right. I did you pay, were you paying attention? Check your notes, review, come back, answer the question. All right. Lasting influence on the legal system, the unified law code. Did you put B? B is the right answer. All right, remember, in this lesson, we're comparing the American French Revolutions. We just went through causes of the French Revolution, characteristics of the French Revolution, effects of the French Revolution. Now, let's get to that writing prompt. Here it is. To what extent were the causes of the American and French Revolutions similar? So before I help you break this down, let's look at the prompt from last time. To what extent did the Enlightenment play a role in the American Revolution? And I'm going to give you three student examples uh, that um, students turned in. And I want to grade them with you to help you improve your own writing. So here we go. First, though, let's remember how I grade the introductory pair. I'm looking for a thesis, response to the prompt with a historically defensible claim that establishes a line of reasoning. That's the thesis. And also the introductory paragraph must have a contextualization statement that describes a broader historical context relevant to the prompt. So in these three examples, do you see these two things? Read this one and then pause the video, read it, decide yes to the thesis, yes to context, and come back and hear me give my thoughts. All right, does it have a thesis? <laughs> kind of unclear. The person wrote the alignment played an extent, but I'm not I'm not sure what that means. It'd be better to have said the alignment played a significant role. That would have been more clear in the American Revolution by protecting everyone equally. But by protecting everyone equally, I'm I'm not sure what the person means by that. This third sentence is better. The leaders of the American Revolution were influenced by the Enlightenment because American colonists didn't have these rights, they rebelled against England for independence. Oof. Again, it's mumbled, it's jumbled. I can't give a point either for a thesis statement or for context. I don't see any background information here. All right, what about this one? Pause the video, read it, grade it. All right, thesis, yeah. Many of the leaders of the American Revolution were influenced by enlightenment ideas and strategies such as Equality, religious tolerance, and freedom of speech. Line of reasoning? Yes. In, in that last sentence, even better. The Enlightenment ideas and strategies were the main guidance for the colonists to become their own nation. That is an argument with a line of reasoning related to the prompt. Is there a context? Is there a contextualization statement? No. Let's see if this last um, author wrote one. Kind of. 
Write that first sentence. The Enlightenment was a period in the latter half of the 18th century where many thinkers condemned the legal blah, 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 blah. Is it enough? Not quite. It should be three to four sentences, but that's a good start right there. And then does it have a thesis statement? The Enlightenment played a big role, argument, in the American Revolution, heavily, heavily influencing our Declaration of Independence and the form of government we have. What's the line of reasoning? The form of government we have. It played a big role influencing the form of government. That is a clear line of reasoning. Counts. Nice job, person. Okay. Remember, though, this time you are answering or responding to this prompt. To what extent were the causes of the American and French revolutions similar? So first things first, as I said last time, you got to analyze the prompt. What's the skill? What's the topic? What's the time period? Pause the video. Answer those three questions. Skill? Causes. It is clear. It's right there. It tells you right there. Topic? Uh, American and French revolutions. Uh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Similar. Ah, uh, this one's kind of tricky because what is it really asking you to do? It's asking you to compare. All right. What is it asking you to compare? The causes. So it's, it's both skills in here, but the main prompt is a comparison of the causes. You get that? Time period, turn of the 18th century. All right. So now you got to gather some evidence. So you need to gather evidence for, for the causes of the American Revolution, and then you need to gather evidence for what were causes of the French Revolution. Once you have those causes, right, cause of the American, causes of the French, then you can look to see are they alike or are they not. And based on that, you can then write your thesis statement. And like I said last time, start with the why. The causes were either very similar or not very similar. And once you decide which way you're going to go there, then you create your two main points, or if you can only get one, just one. And again, use the themes, economic causes, political causes, social causes, okay? These are where the themes, especially in this prompt, um, come in handy. And then can you think of an X, a counter argument? So if you're arguing that they were very similar, a counter argument would be, well, here's a, here's a way they weren't very similar. Or if your argue, argument is they weren't very similar, the counter argument would be, yet they were similar in this area. So remember, that's like advanced thesis writing. If you can only come up with one point, that's okay. And if you wanna put your why statement first and then say because, that's fine too. As long as the argument is clear, it's defensible, and there's a line of reasoning. And don't forget your contextualization statement. You gotta give me information that re explains the relative historical background of this essay. What is gonna be relevant historical background to the American and French revolutions? Wait, did, did you say did you say enlightenment? I hope you said enlightenment. If you don't tell me about the enlightenment in this essay, it is not going to get full credit. You you can't understand the cause of the American and French revolutions without an understanding of the enlightenment. So tell me what it was when it was, who were some of the key figures as a way to introduce your thesis statement. All right, work hard. Let me know how I can help. See you next time.